You know, I, I think strategic planning has, for many reasons, uh, become an instrument of financial planning. A and it really is a case of, you know, what's going to happen to sales, what's going to happen to costs, uh, and therefore what's going to happen to our bottom line. And then looking across all of the products that an enterprise sells and making some um, portfolio decisions on how they'll allocate resources across all of these various businesses. Obviously, the high flyers will get the lion's share, and those that are, uh, uh, that are not showing great performance will be either harvested or sold off or, or terminated. But strategic planning, in its essence, was really, a, uh, really an extension of the whole notion of contingency planning. It was being ready for the future and, and trying to make certain that as that future evolved, you were properly prepared for it. So strategic planning really has its, at, at, its, at its core, I believe, uh, a return back to that basics that I talked about earlier. What is the problem the consumer is trying to solve? And once you understand that, you can ask the question about, is our product the best solution to that problem? Or what things do we have to add to the product, either through product features or through associated services, in order to make it a more perfect solution? What we also have to be conscious of, though, is that over time, number one, consumers are going to change. And we have to understand not just, not just the, the global or macro changes that are going to happen. You know, we know that, that in five years, everyone who's still alive is going to be five years older. Um, you know, we know that they're going to be at a different life stage and have different needs and different pressures and so on. But attitudes will change as well. A and we have to factor into our, into our equation then, how will those attitudes affect whether we consider our product still to be the perfect solution? We also have to be conscious of technology because there may be many things that we would have always liked to have done but couldn't do because there was no technological capacity. In fact, marketing is filled with these to this day. We'd always have preferred to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a consumer, but we couldn't do that, and so we had to use mass media. We had no choice. We always knew past behavior was a better predictor of future behavior than attitudes, but we couldn't measure past behavior. We couldn't access that information, so we made do. So as technology changes, so too does our capacity to more fully satisfy the consumer's problem. And then, last but not least, and this is kind of going back to the question of, of, of economics versus psychology. I find many students relatively uninformed about the importance of economics in the study of marketing. Not just uh, the microeconomics of running a firm, but how it affects the consumer and their budget decisions. Discretionary income, right? credit, savings, all of these factors have to be understood because they really set the context within which the consumer seeks to find a solution to their problem. So I may want, for example, a Lamborghini, but unless the Minister of Education decides to elevate university budgets, to make full-time faculty suddenly independently wealthy, I'm not getting a Lamborghini. And so if I'm part of your target market, you have to appreciate the economic pressures that are going to reside with me in order to figure out how to, how to solve me, uh, how to serve me, and frankly, how not to serve me. Um, you know, I, I give the example that uh, in class that, that in times of recession, one of the fastest things we see happen, of course, is massive sales. You know, uh, 2008, the recession hit. It hit almost overnight. Uh, suddenly, Best Buy has got a, a warehouse full of inventory of flat screen TVs. So what do they do? They put them on sale. They try to move them out as quickly as they can. I'm a full-time tenured faculty member. I am liquid. I don't fear for job stability. Uh, I'm in the market for a flat screen TV. Uh, I know what prices are. I walk into Best Buy prepared to pay the price. And what does Best Buy say? Oh no, please, you know, take some back. It, it's too much, it's too much. It's on sale this week. Well, okay, I'll take it. I didn't ask for it, but if you're giving it, I'm happy to take it. If you don't understand economics and that it doesn't, and that 
these economic circumstances don't affect everybody in the same way, then you're bound to be surprised when, during a recession, luxury brands like Louis Vuitton grow at double-digit levels. You're surprised when, even though Hyundai becomes the fastest growing car brand, Mercedes-Benz and BMW become number two and three, respectively. Um, you know, this requires you to, to be able to look at, at people and say, geez, are we all affected to the same extent? And clearly the answer is no. Um, World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, you know, they recently uncovered that the, the top six billionaires in the world hold half of the world's wealth. Six people, half of the world's wealth. That the, the, there is a growing and massive disparity now between the haves and have-nots, the so-called 1%, maybe even less than 1%, and, and the rest of us. And, and if you understand that, and if you were at all a student of, of, of politics and sociology, you come to understand that that kind of, disre uh, of unrest, that kind of circumstance ultimately manifests itself in people's behavior as citizens and, of course, as consumers.